So I'm going to talk uh, about the work that we're doing across a range of projects. And you can see a lot of the project logos here that, um, that this, this work relates to. And it all relates to uh, immune-mediated inflammatory diseases, IMIDs. Doesn't quite fit on the slide, but um, sorry for the abbreviation straight up. So um, what are immune-mediated inflammatory diseases? So they are, they're chronic diseases. You're probably familiar with them all there. Um, they have um, features of prominent inflammation, uh, and they're caused by a failure of tolerance, tolerance or regulation of the immune system. And they include things like RA, psoriasis, lupus, uh, and, and a range of other diseases. And they affect about 2 to 5% of the population. Uh, and their instance is, is increasing. And they're thought to be the result of immune responses against um, the self, autoimmunity, or, or they may also be uh, spurred by a, a microbial antigenic effect. Um, and they can be systemic. I would say actually probably most of them are actually have, have systemic effects, or they can be organ specifics. So we, we characterize RA due to joint inflammation, but it has systemic effects, and just in the same way, psoriasis, skin, but also systemic effects. Now, what's really interesting about IMIDs uh, is that they're highly overlapping. Um, there's a lot of comorbidity, there's a lot of similarities, so it's a great paradigm for, for computational biology and for, for AI. So just to give you an idea of the shared pathology of IMIDs, the hand is... Uh, affected in almost every uh, image that you can you can come across, uh, and so if you look at I mean this um, on on the left here I think is really interesting. If you talk to a rheumatologist, they can actually tell a lot about um, what images you might be suffering from uh, just by the the joints that are affected. And I think this is really interesting that different joints in the hand are affected differently by different immune diseases. Uh, and so there's this sort of characteristic joint involvement. So if you, if you go and see a rheumatologist, they'll, they'll pay a lot of um, uh, care and attention to your hands and which, which joints hurt, are the, um, are the, is the pain symmetrical. It's all really interesting biology and really interesting um, systems, and I think you could you could probably do a, a whole systems biology project on the joints in the hand. And of course, um, there's also involvement with skin. So you see commonalities with lupus um, and psoriasis, for example, both having skin rash components and the joint. And so you see joint swellings in both psoriatic arthritis and in rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. Um, and so on... on the one level, you've got this huge um, range of overlapping pathology. But on the other level, um, we're not dealing with a static disease. And this also um, uh, adds a nice uh, dimension of complexity. So um, RA, for example, is uh, a progressive disease. So um, after a year and a half, you, might be, you, you may see um, a few things in, in ultrasound and x-ray. Five years, um, you, you, you'll see uh, progressive uh, degeneration, and 15 years, you see um, the, the really severe progressive degeneration. Now, one thing um, that also you need to bear in mind is that you don't see people um, like the, the hands on the right-hand side in the clinic because treatments are so effective. So when you're trying to study uh, the continuum of uh, uh, IMIDs, you're actually studying a, a continuum that is masked by treatment and by effective biologics. So that's uh, another um, complication. So if you actually, um, if you look at, uh, I have a pointer here. Yeah, so if you, uh, if you, place the continuum of disease um, for, say, uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, you can see that you'll see patients um, from early on presenting uh, with moderate arthritis. They'll go on to uh, diseases like methotrexate, and they'll um, often respond to those. But then as their disease progresses, 
they'll uh, re uh, start non-responding to those therapies. They'll go on to um, more um, aggressive therapies, that, particularly the anti-TNFs and biologics. And in the US, we're, we're now seeing um, early um, RA cases going straight on to biologics. But in the, in the UK, there's still a, um, a, an NHS path of moving from methotrexate to, um, to biologic drugs. And what are the causes of treatment failure? So these could be multiplex. They could be uh, due to the underlying match of the endotype that's being treated. They could be due to immunogenicity, so that's um, an immune response to the drug itself and deactivation of the drug. They could be due to the evolve, um, evolving state of the disease in, in each patient. And of course, things like side effects. Um, uh, infection is a common side effect. There's some immune suppression with biologic drugs and off-target effects. So biologics are really revolutionizing uh, IMIDs. Um, Anti-TNF biologics alone have been indicated for six um, IMIDs uh, in, in a range of different um, target areas. The problem is that um, anti-TNFs have um, a limited efficacy between 60 to 80 percent, depending on the disease, depending on the state. And they're very, very costly. They cost about 20,000 um, pounds a year. And partly to follow up on this and to address this, there are next generation biologics coming into the clinic which are much more specific to particular diseases and particular targets. And these are showing much higher efficacy, but they're still not complete efficacy. And there's still that issue about cost and uh, limited efficacy. And just a, um, a point to highlight here is that when people talk about anti-TNFs, we're not talking about the same drug, the same mechanism. There are a whole range of drugs that people call anti-TNFs, but they, um, they actually have quite different mechanisms. They may be um, human-mouse hybrids. They might be um, um, hybrids with um, PEG, or they could actually be um, complete hybrid molecules. So like etanocept, which was one of the first generation anti-TNFs, is actually a hybrid uh, TNF and lymphotoxin receptor uh, antagonist. And these also have very different uh, immunogenicity as well. So um, just to, to, to the set the, um, the scene of why um, endotypes, why um, underlying pathotypes of disease could be important, uh, here's an example, uh, a, a sort of canonical example, but actually fits very well with RA. There are probably, we, we think there's evidence, there's probably three main um, uh, CCP positive RA endotypes. Uh, and um, so if you can classify your patients uh, by endotype, first off, if you don't classify a patient by endotype and a biologic only works in one endotype, then you'll only see limited efficacy uh, in, in a, uh, a patient group that's not stratified by endotype. But if you can uh, identify endotypes and link drugs to endotypes, then you can uh, expect much, much higher uh, efficacy. So what we're doing in, in a range of stratified medicine projects that I'll talk about uh, is we're doing multi-omics uh, to uh, generate data for the to, to actually get a good idea of what these underlying endotypes are. So we're taking genetic data, uh, omics, RNA, proteomics, and uh, looking at drug response. And from that, we're building up the underlying disease endotypes, so different pathways that may be active in different um, disease endotypes are um, showing up in our, our studies. And then from that, we're looking at the drug endotype so the drug endotype is what the drug does to the body, the pathways that are activated by a particular drug. Disease endotype is what the disease does to, to the body. Uh, and you would hope that um, where the drug endotype and the disease endotype overlap extensively or completely, then you would have a, um, a highly efficacious drug. And the, um, the plan then is to take panels of response biomarkers that can indicate uh, which patients would be suited to, to which disease to which drug. And one, one more thing to, to highlight here is that biologic targets are um, really very, very highly connected. So if you look at TNF here, 
um, all of these other direct interactors are all targets of successful biologics in emids. So we can see um, RA targets here, uh, psoriasis targets here, and uh, lupus targets here. And if you run this through um, a pathway um, uh, mechanism model, this is actually an ingenuity pathway, uh, it predicts that if you inhibit TNF, then you would actually downregulate all of these targets. And to some extent, we, we see that, but not completely. And um, what's, what's interesting is that we see, despite the fact that we'd expect all these biologics to work in similar ways, they, they really don't in the diseases. For example, anti-TNF uh, exacerbates lupus. And um, so we, we just don't understand why that is. And that's really, um, the, we're trying to get our hand a handle on those, why, why these um, endotypes are not behaving in the way that we might expect. So I've talked a lot about the stratified medicine projects that, that um, I'm working on here. So we have, um, we're involved in four projects. Uh, so we've got two projects working on RA, RA map and Matura, uh, one project working in psoriasis and one in lupus. And three of these are working specifically on biologic response endotypes, and one's working on disease endotypes. What's um, really good about this is that um, by um, applying a shared infrastructure, and because there are many very common um, objectives across these um, projects, we've been able to really uh, build synergies across the projects and really think about how we can go to the next stage and compare across diseases. And one of the ways we've done this is by having a common infrastructure on all of, all of those projects. So we're using uh, Transmart for um, omics uh, and for, for clinical trial data, and we're using I2B2 for um, patient registry and healthcare health record data. Um, Transmart uh, is an open source data warehouse that was um, released by Janssen about five years into the public domain. And I2B2 is, a, is a, um, a kind of um, cousin database of Transmart. The two share a similar schema, uh, and they work quite well together. So we're using um, Transmart in all of our stratified medicine projects. And so the schema for each project essentially looks the same. This is the schema for SORT. So we're using I2B2 for um, biologic registry, patient cohort selection and Transmart for um, collecting omic data in, and for analytics across omics data. As you can see, there's um, a data warehouse is, um, is a great way to store your data and share data, but there's a huge amount of data curation uh, and processing and standardization that takes place to get your data into the data warehouse. And that's really important for um, applying things like um, AI and machine learning because you, you have a standardized data set, but it's not easy and it requires, this is actually probably the hardest thing. The AI and the machine learning is nothing compared to cleaning up data, um, cleaning up electronic health record data, getting access to the right um, clinical records. Uh, that's the real challenge. So here's an example of how we're using AI in, in these projects and across projects. So uh, we're interested in biologic response. We need to define response to a biologic before we can um, correlate that with genomic markers. So for example, uh, we have access to the British Association of Dermolo Dermatologists Biologic Intervention Register, known as BABBIR. So this involves uh, 153 dermatology centers and has 10,000 patients uh, including 6,800 patients that have been treated with biologics. And it uh, links through to their electronic health record and has longitudinal follow-up on those patients. So it's, it's a really rich resource. So um, Nofar Geifman, who uh, works in the uh, University of Manchester in the SORT team, uh, has been doing some work on the Babbeer database. So this, uh, this is what the data looks like when you take uh, PARSI, data, which is the uh, psoriasis area severity index. So this is a, a measure of response to biologic treatment. And if you look at uh, 3,800 subjects, 14,000 observations, if you plot it all out, this is what it looks like. So we, we need to try to make sense of this and to pick out the, the responder uh, 
uh, categories within this group. So uh, NOFAR applied latent class mixed models, LCMMs, uh, and she used these to find groups and subgroups um, in, in this, this uh, data. And, and essentially, this is a latent class analysis on longitudinal data, uh, and it accounts for both the, inter, the individual variability and the latent group structure in the data. Uh, and it uses random effects to model the correlations between uh, all these repeated measurements in, in the same subject. Um, again, so these subjects are all have to be kind of pseudo aligned to, to get them all on the same time scale in their treatment. And that also is, is actually a huge task and really quite challenging to get the data in good shape. So after um, applying a latent class, we, we got something out that looked like this. So uh, we have um, a classifier. So we can, with some confidence, we can predict which um, class a patient uh, um, is likely to um, be placed in, and we can actually have a confidence call on that. It's, you know, we could say they're 85% likely to be in class one or class two. And then we get overall um, classifiers here. So we can see we have one uh, class, class one, where the patients um, improve a, a bit, uh, and, but then plateau. Uh, and then there's another class where they improve quickly and, and then, then, then plateau at, at a, a well-managed state. And so um, here's where the work across the, the projects um, is really nice. So while we were doing this work with SORT, with uh, psoriasis, the um, RAMAP project was also looking at similar data in the RAMAP um, study, which is a, a study of early RA. And here, Brian Tom actually independently didn't actually talk to NOFAR, although they've talked since. He also came up with um, a, an LCMM approach to look at um, uh, therapeutic response in RA. And as you can see, he got three endotypes here, but um, they actually look pretty similar to um, the psoriasis. And also another study, a Canadian RA study, also um, used the same approach and ended up with quite similar endotypes. So there's a potential here. Uh, although these are different response measures with very different ways of collection, uh, there's a potential to actually compare IMID populations on um, a common response framework, which, which is really exciting, considering that a lot of these patients will be on the same drugs. So uh, this is how we're using Transmart uh, for, for these projects. So taking the RAMAP Transmart, we have a, um, a data warehouse um, web interface. Uh, so you can go into RAMAP the RMAP Transmart, you can see um, we have a, an area for capturing raw data and unstructured data uh, that can be securely shared with the consortium. But you could also analyze data and um, by, by um, going through this uh, dialogue and, and se selecting subsets. So here's an example where we took the um, two latent classes um, for the, uh, the two main latent classes found in RA and we can then um, start to actually compare how different uh, clinical measures um, differ between latent classes. So taking two latent classes and looking at platelets and rheumatoid factor, uh, so you just drag and drop the data for these patients here. Uh, you can then start to um, draw on the fly, you can, you can get views of the data. So here, for example, we see uh, a significant difference between uh, the platelet levels at baseline for the two different latent classes. So we can see that class one has lower platelets on average than, than class two. And, and for the actual genomic endotypes, we're, we're at a stage where we're preparing lots of papers across these projects. Uh, so we'd kind of watch this space over the next uh, six months to a year. We have some really interesting omic uh, endotype data uh, and, and uh, immune classifiers using the Chassabel module approach. Um, I'm not going to talk about this anymore, but um, the next stage, so we've got clinical response um, uh, classifiers, and the next will be to apply the molecular classifiers. And this, I should say, all of this is hosted on the MRC eMedLab cloud. 
which is uh, a hub of uh, um, HPC computing funded by £9 million MRC investment. Um, and we're using this to, to host all the virtual machines for these projects all in one cloud environment. Uh, and this gives us a really uh, brilliant synergies across projects. So we've got the, the RA projects, but we've also got uh, some other immune uh, projects, and we've also got a juvenile arthritis project in here. So six projects, five diseases, common drugs, common mechanisms, common infrastructure. Now, we had all this coming together, and this uh, is a compelling sort of case for a, a pan-immune uh, analysis. So we took this to the MRC, uh, with a proposal called um, Imid Bio UK. Now, um, there is, there's a tendency, I don't know how many of you work in consortia, sometimes it's hard to get consortia to, to work together and to share data. Um, in, in the Imid field, I'm, I'm glad to say we're really bucking this trend. So uh, we've got lots of rheumatologists and dermatologists here working on all of these different projects. And they, they, they all get on quite well, and we're actually in a really fortunate uh, state where we could get all these PIs to come together and to agree to share access to their biobanks and to share their data and put all of their data in one data warehouse. And we also, we're, we're in a really fortunate situation that there's massive <coughs> connectivity between the actual teams. So this is the RA map systems biology uh, analysis team. And, and you can see, I just kind of went through this, and uh, the interconnectivity between these projects is, is huge, and that really uh, gives us um, a very compelling case. So we took this to the, to the MRC um, about two months ago. Uh, Imid Bio UK is um, a partnership between all of these projects, many of the ones I've talked about, but also a Scottish RA cohort autoimmune liver disease, Sjogren's uh, syndrome, uh, and um, a, um, a few other registries. Uh, we've got more than 10,000 uh, IMID patients. We're going to virtually um, integrate those into a bioresource. Uh, and we're going to build a kind of mother of all transmarts that will contain all of this data. And we can start to do uh, IMID uh, uh, discovery across that. And I'm, I'm really glad to say that the MRC funded this last month. So uh, it's, uh, we're, we're really um, hitting the ground running now. We actually uh, we start this month. So uh, we're, there's a lot of excitement around this. Uh, so I will end there. There's, it's really a really big team effort here, particularly um, the clinicians um, have been really very helpful um, in bringing all this together in, in um, sharing data and in allowing us to, to work across all these different projects. Fascinating talk. Um, questions for Mike? Have we got any questions? No. One thing about uh, this sort of data sharing and everything that kind of comes back is because of the anonymization, et cetera, are you able to provide a resource that then could be used for trialing new agents that might have be, you've got a set of patients there who may respond to a particular new therapy? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think that could either be um, virtual by, by comparing um, where data is already being collected and, and by comparing to other other comparator data for similar drugs. Um, it is being used for trials, so that the Matura project, which is the RA stratification, is is being used for a, a trial for a, a, not a new agent but a repositioned uh, biologic. Oh, okay. So it potentially could be extended. Oh, great. Any questions for Mike? I think everybody's gasping for coffee, yeah. so um, we'll end it there. I'd like to thank the speakers from the first part of this morning's session. Thank you very much. Thank you.